Put on your powdered wig because it is Monday, May 8th, 1665, and the third issue of Philosophical Transactions has just come out. Let's dive in. Some Observations and Experiments Upon Maydew That ingenious and inquisitive gentleman, Master Thomas Henshaw, having had occasion to make use of a great quantity of maydew, did, by several casual essays on that subject, make the following observations and trials, and presented them to the Royal Society. Maydew is, as it sounds, dew collected in the month of May. It was widely believed at the time that washing it would improve one's complexion, a tradition which continues into the modern day. In the current form, the dew must be applied directly to one's face on the morning of the 1st of May. But the 1652 book, The Natural History of Ireland by Gerard Boat, describes the form the early society would have been familiar with. In the month of May especially, and also in part of the month of June, they would go forth betimes in the morning, and before sunrising, into a green field, and there either with their hands strike off the dew from the tops of the herbs into a dish, or else throwing clean linen clothes upon the ground, take off the dew from the herbs into them, and afterwards wring it out into dishes. This article from Master Hinshaw seems to have come out of a discussion in a Royal Society meeting from April of the previous year, where he had been asked to perform more experiments on the material and to write up the results. And it is a good thing that there was an established maydew extraction industry, because he used a lot. At least ten gallons are mentioned in the various experiments he described. The results are particularly interesting to the modern eye, as most of the changes he recorded are the result of biological processes, algae growing, insects breeding in the stagnant water, etc. But this was still in the era where Aristotle's spontaneous generation was taken for granted, and they naturally would have accepted these growths as being a property of the maydew itself. The motion of the second comet predicted, by the same gentleman who predicted that of the former. Adrian Azu is back with a new comet. This is the second comet spotted that year, but fear not. He would not have been surprised that there have been two comets within so short a time, seeing, saith he, that there were four, at least three, in the year 1618, and in other years there have been two and more at the same time. What he adds about their signification, we leave to astrologers to dispute it with him. This comet is harder to track than the first, as it is currently very near the sun, as seen from the Earth. So, like Mercury, it can only be visible shortly after sunset or shortly before sunrise. He also mentions the problem of refraction. They knew by this point that the Earth's atmosphere would bend light for objects seen near the horizon, but they didn't yet have reliable methods for compensating for this effect. This is now a standard operation, as can be seen by this page of corrections in the Nautical Almanac, but sightings higher up in the sky will always be more reliable. As with his previous ephemeride, he is asking for other astronomers to send in their observations, so his predictions can be tested. He wishes that all the changes that shall fall out in this comet might be exactly observed, because of its not being swift, and the motion of the Earth very sensible, unless the comet be extremely remote. We should find much more light from this than the former star about the grand question whether the Earth moves or not. This author, having all along entertained himself with the hopes that the motion of comets would evince whether the Earth did move or not, and this very comet seemed to him to have by design appeared for that end, if it had had more latitude, and that consequently we might have seen it before daybreak. A relation of the advice given by Monsieur Petit, intendant of the fortifications of Normandy, touching the conjunction of the ocean and the Mediterranean. These are some speculations by Monsieur Petit about the possibility of joining the Mediterranean and the Atlantic via canal in the south of France. This wasn't a new idea. King Francois Premier had brought Leonardo da Vinci himself in the early 16th century to look at the problem. By the time of this article, interest was getting more serious, and the planning for what would become the Canal du Midi was well underway. Construction had even started on an experimental section of canal the previous year. The complete link to the Atlantic wouldn't be finished until 1683, but it marked the beginning of the great age of canal building in Europe. Monsieur Petit, however, did not have access to any of the survey work, leaving this article entirely speculative. It ends with a mention of some other possibilities for canals, including one of particular relevance to 2021. And he is of opinion that the most important of all is that of conjoining the Red Sea by the Nile with the Mediterranean, 
which he looks upon as the most excellent conveniency to go into the East Indies without doubling the Cape of Good Hope, and yet it could not be executed by those great kings of Egypt that raised so many stupendous pyramids. Of the Way of Killing Rattlesnakes This is a recap of Captain Taylor's account in a July 1664 meeting of the Royal Society, describing how rattlesnakes can be killed by use of the wild pennyroyal plant. This was also known as Dittania virginia, aka Serpentaria virginiana, and now known as Virginia snake root, or Ristolochia serpentaria. And it does produce a Ristolochic acid, a carcinogenic, mutagenic, and nephrotoxic phytochemical, so the good captain may have been onto something. The deed is accomplished by waving the bruised leaves of the plant in the face of the snake. Captain Taylor claims it died in less than half an hour's time, which makes me question this approach as a practical snake defense. Oddly, the article here doesn't mention what seems to be the most important detail of the original presentation. He affirmed that the water of this herb, taken inwardly by those who were bitten by rattlesnakes, cured them perfectly. A relation of persons killed with subterraneous damps. This is a tragic story of the dangers of working in confined spaces. The colliers being hereby out of work, some of them adventures to work upon old remains of walls, so near the old wastes, that striking through the slender partitions of the coal wall that separated between them and the place where they used to work, they quickly perceived their error, and fearing to be stifled by the bad air that they knew possessed these old wastes, in regard not only of the damps, which such wastes do usually afford, but because there having for many years been a fire in those wastes that filled them with stifling fumes and vapors, retired immediately and saved themselves from the eruptions of the damp. Damp was the term given to the various kinds of gases in a mine that could asphyxiate you and or explode. There is a good reason so much of De Re Metallica was given to descriptions of ventilation systems for mines. Unfortunately for these miners, the idea of carrying a canary to give advanced warning was a much later development, first being mentioned in 1913. But next day, some seven or eight of them came no sooner so far down the stairs that led them to the place where they had been the day before, as they intended, but upon their stepping into the place, where the air was infected, they fell down dead, as if they had been shot. This concludes with an early description of an all-too-common tragedy in confined spaces. And there being amongst them one, whose wife was informed he was stifled in that place, she went down so far without inconvenience, that seeing her husband near her, ventured to go to him, but being choked by the damp, as soon as she came near him, she fell down dead by him. Scenes like this still happen today, sometimes whole piles of bodies building up as people keep rushing in to save their friend, the previous would-be rescuer. Seriously, speaking as someone into potentially dangerous industrial hobbies, do not go into confined spaces without proper training and equipment. And worse, be prepared to not go help someone who did go in and suddenly passed out. You've got to call for help and then stand there not helping, or else you'll just become another victim. It's grim stuff. Of the mineral of Liège, yielding both brimstone and vitriol, and the way of extracting them out of it used at Liège. A description of sulfur mining in Belgium. This work can only proceed in the winter, we're told, as during the summer the water supply for the pumps dries up and the mine floods. Ever wonder why mining is associated with mountainous areas, particularly in pre-modern times? In part, because it's easier to see promising geology if it's not covered in soil. But more importantly, mines, being holes in the ground, tend to flood. Before the atmospheric engine, your best options for doing this needed hilly terrain, either by using water power to pump the mine out, or by cutting it at it, or drainage tunnel, up from a lower area. Vitriol is the old name given to various metallic sulfides. In this case, they are extracting green vitriol, also called copperas, which was used in inks and for dyeing fabric. Despite the name, however, it contains no copper, being an iron sulfate. It could also be turned into sulfuric acid, Hence, a sharp, biting attack is vitriolic. To make copperas, or vitriol, they take a quantity of the said ashes, and throwing them into a square planked pit in the earth, some four foot deep and eight foot square, they cover the same with ordinary water, and let it lie twenty-four hours, or until an egg will swim upon the liquor, which is a sign that it is strong enough. A further account of Mr. Boyle's experimental history of cold. Good news, fans of cold. The publication of Boyle's book was delayed, but now it's out. This review lists some more exciting contents of the book. Will fine frozen apples and eggs in the wrong way spoil them? Can one preserve meats through the use of cold? 
Bacon's influence lives on. Could one fill a castle's moat with alcohol so it couldn't freeze in the winter? It also acknowledges that water expands when it freezes, which, while commonly understood now, was not always the case. Some of the medieval arguments against vacuum were based on the assumption that, like basically every other substance, water contracts when it freezes. In a sealed container, this would form a vacuum, which nature doesn't allow, thus the container spontaneously breaks to prevent this from happening. So Boyle was one up on that, at least. The book asks if all this contraction and expansion could be solved with the Cartesian or Epicurean hypothesis, meaning the idea that matter is made up from discrete atoms instead of being a continuous substance. This was already an ancient debate in the 17th century, tracing back to the Epicureans of the classical world. Part of their philosophy was that everything was made of atoms. They also believed that, if the gods existed, they were more or less irrelevant to human life. This link between atoms and agnosticism, or worse, atheism, persisted, and that meant that any theory involving atoms went seriously out of favor once Christianity became dominant. This was part of why the possibility of a vacuum was so contentious. Atoms naturally imply vacuum because what else could be between them? And that's it for issue 3. We close with an update on the hydraulic blower mentioned in the last episode. It was brought to my attention that this is probably a very poorly described tromp. These do work through means of a venturi effect, but they use it to draw air down with the flowing water into a cavity, pressurizing it. This can then be tapped and the air allowed to escape. It's an air compressor with no moving parts, just flowing water. The best source I can find for these is the Italian Wikipedia page, which contains many references to these being used industrially as far back as at least 1589. On a personal note, I'll be taking next month off, as I'll be in the middle of a train and canal trip to celebrate my parents' 50th anniversary. But Philosophical Reactions will be back in August with issue number four, where we will find Adriana Zhu and Robert Hooke getting very politely snippy with each other.